So I thought that life must have previously existed in black and white, and that colour had slowly crept into the world. And I asked my mum, is that the case? And she said, uh uh, yes. <laughs> and that they'd had big parties every time a new colour had appeared. And that, that sense of magic, it stayed with me. And it's probably the reason why I'm an eye specialist now. Vision's a miracle. It's the sense we most fear losing. It's a sense we most fear our children losing. Childhood blindness impacts not just on the child, not just on their family, but also on the wider society, because these children need and deserve the extra support to make sure that they can be the best version of themselves. In the UK, the most common reason why a child is blind in both eyes is because that child has a rare disease. Rare diseases are those which affect fewer than 1 in 2,000 people. Individually, these diseases are uncommon, but there are thousands of them. So collectively, rare diseases impact on 1 in 17 people. Whatever the cause of visual loss, there are ways that we can prevent or try to prevent the impact of blindness. There's primary prevention, preventing a disease before it can even strike. Measles is a major cause of childhood blindness across the world. So vaccination programmes are key to saving the sight and lives of millions. Secondary prevention, a child has developed a disease that could potentially blind them. What are we going to do to make sure they don't lose vision? Then there's tertiary prevention. A child's already lost vision because of a blinding disease. What are we going to do to make sure that that visual loss doesn't define their quality of life? Secondary prevention is why I most usually work as a clinician, diagnosing the child in front of me, doing what's needed to protect their sight. It's also my main research area. What can we do to protect the sight of all patients? In the UK, when you're born, in the first few days of life, you'll get your eyes checked. And the key thing we're looking for is cataract, or clouding of the lens inside the eye. Childhood cataract is the most important preventable cause of childhood blindness globally. When you diagnose a baby with a cataract, you've got to act quickly. They'll need surgery in the first few months of life. And the reason is that my mother wasn't that far out. A newborn's vision is pretty poor. Day by day, colour, form, contrast creeps into their world as their brains learn to process the information coming in from their eyes. So in the 1960s, two American scientists changed what we understand about how children learn to see. Let's trigger warning, I'm going to talk about animal experiments here. So they took kittens, they stitched closed the eyelids of one or both sides, allowed those kittens to mature into adult cats and then opened the eyelids. Even though the eyes underneath were normal, the cats couldn't use them to see. If you interrupt the signals coming into the brain in early childhood, the visual part of your brain does not develop. And that failure to develop the visual part is called amblyopia. Amblyopia is actually quite common. Probably about 3% of us in this room have it to some extent, typically because when we were young children, we had a stronger need for glasses in one eye versus the other eye. We didn't get those glasses in time. And the brain started listening to the stronger eye and putting down strong links to the stronger eye and ignored the weaker eye. So Ambiope is the reason why every child should have their vision tested in the first year of school, because that way they can get an intervention when the brain is still young and juicy enough to put down those strong links. If you wait till they're too old, after the age of eight, it's really hard to build those strong links between the eye and the brain. All right, so back to cataract. The lens inside the eye is like a transparent M&M or transparent Smarty, casing on the outside, clear fibers on the inside. Cataract is when the chocolate, the clear fibres, go grey and cloudy. It's an age-related change. So some people, like you get grey hair, some people get cataract in their 50s, some people don't get cataract until their 90s. But some babies are born with cataract. The operation to fix that is similar to the one we use in adults. You make a small keyhole incision into the eye, a hole in the front of the casing, and you suck out the chocolate, you suck out the cloudy fibres. 
That initial operation is only half the battle in children. If you leave it as it is, the sight coming in is really blurred, really out of focus. There is no lens. And that child will get deep, severe, and irreversible amblyopia. So it's really important that you replace the focusing power. And you can do that with glasses, but glasses are heavy for the infant face, and you can get a failure to develop your peripheral vision. So ideally, we use contact lenses. As you can imagine, putting a contact lens into a baby or an infant can be a challenge. So, surgeons started implanting artificial lenses back inside that casing. We already do it for adults. It works really well for adults. It's routine practice. And the potential benefits in young children were huge. The problem is, a baby or infant's eye is so different to an adult's eye. You do 90% of your ocular growth in the first two years of your life. So we recently completed a national study looking to see what our outcomes were like following cataract surgery in early life. We identified all the surgeons in the UK and Ireland who manage these children. We got them all together. We got them all speaking the same language, using the same descriptive terms. And we watched outcomes following surgery with and without intraocular lenses. This kind of study is called a prospective cohort study. And this study was called IOL Under 2. And what IUL under two found was that these artificial lens implants were not the best ideas for babies and infants. Their eyes tended to grow inflammatory membranes across the artificial lenses, needing to them requiring more surgery. At that time, lens implants had become routine practice for these young children. So these study findings helped to change practice and make management safer. And also, it highlighted the importance of supporting the families who are using contact lenses. OK, so childhood uveitis is another rare and potentially blinding disease. It's inflammatory. If you hit yourself hard enough on the leg, the area becomes red, and swollen. Your immune system is making the blood vessels in that area leaky, letting out healing agents to repair the damage. Sometimes that inflammatory response can be over the top. In uveitis, that inflammation happens inside the eye. And if it's not controlled, it can lead to scar tissue and visual loss. In childhood, uveitis is chronic. It comes in slowly, and it can stay around for years. And some children don't know it's happening. They don't know it's happening until they've lost vision. And that's too late. And just like other inflammatory diseases of childhood, like eczema, like asthma, there is no cure for uveitis. We can control it with steroid drops and steroid tablets. They work really well at dampening down your immune system, but they're a short-term fix. And like I said, uveitis is a chronic disease. If you use steroids for too long, it can impact on your bone development. It can give you diabetes. It can make the pressure in the eye go up. It can bring on cataract. So some children need a long-term solution. They need a therapy that can modulate the immune system to allow us to bring down the steroids. These immunomodulators, they're really powerful drugs. They're sort of like a type of chemotherapy, but they can be safe as long as you monitor the children when they're on them. And it's an easy choice to make when the child in front of you is losing vision. But often what we're doing for childhood uveitis is we're trying to prevent visual loss. This child has normal vision, and we're predicting that they're going to lose vision. And for that child with normal vision and their family, it can be a hard decision when there's some uncertainty about how much vision and when they're going to lose. If you ask children with uveitis and their families which questions they want answered, they want to know if we can improve how we monitor disease. They want to know if we can predict which treatment they'll respond to. They want to know if we can better predict their outcomes with and without therapy. So over the next few years, our research group is going to answer these questions and others, and we're going to develop some new tools to help us answer these questions. If you go to the opticians nowadays, you get offered a scan of the back of the eye, an optical coherence tomography picture, or OCT. OCT gives you ridiculously detailed images of the back of the eye. Newer versions of the camera can image the front of the eye. Even newer versions of cameras can image the blood flow in the eye. And we're using these imaging machines to figure out if we can understand more about childhood uveitis. 
So I told you that some children know when their disease is active, but some children don't. Why? In order to drill down into that, we're developing a tool that even young children can use to report how their eyes feel. And we're going to collect a national network of clinicians who are managing this disease. We're all going to agree to speak the same language, capture the same information on these children, and watch them. So prospective cohort study. And by undertaking this and building these new tools, we should, we hope, come up with the answers for the children and families affected. But also, we're going to be developing new tools that might be of use in other childhood blinding disease. Pretty cool. Thank you.